Welcome to Addicted to Watches. Strap yourselves in, because this could be a long one. The term grail watch is thrown around a lot these days. Someone's holy grail of watches. Some people use it to describe one that is absolutely unattainable, but they would love to have. Others use it to describe their dream watch, an achievable but expensive watch. My definition is somewhere closer to the second, though now it is no longer a dream. This is reality. This is the Grand Seiko 2021 Limited Edition SLGA 007, also known as the Lake Sua or Minamo. This is the kind of watch I wouldn't have dreamed of owning even a few years ago. This is an incredible watch for a few reasons and has me evaluating my collection as a whole. It is a watch I was very lucky to be able to purchase living here in Japan, and in my opinion, one of the best watches for me that the brand has ever made. The SLGA007 was released in 2021 to celebrate the 140th anniversary of Seiko. They decided to release this model, limited to 2021 pieces worldwide, to match the year of release. There are a lot of things this watch has that make it special, but the most obvious and most eye-catching is of course that dial. Grand Seiko described this dial as inspired by the soft water surface of Lake Sua, which is where it gets its nickname. While a new watch has since been released with a similar dial in black colour, this was the first time this design debuted. Another first is the inclusion of the 9R2A spring drive movement. This is a movement I could probably create an entire video talking about, and we'll cover a little later in this video. When this watch was announced around August 2021, it received a lot of media hype and attention. As a result of this, much of the allocation of stock around the world sold out before the watch itself was even released. Here in Japan, there were apparently 500 available of the 2000 odd watches made. Since release, prices on the second-hand market have increased from the original retail price, much like many other highly desirable watches. That original price was 990,000 Japanese yen and 8,700 US dollars in the States, a nice little discount for those Americans able to have bought it. This is of course a lot of money for any watch, but even for a brand like Grand Seiko, it is higher than usual. It represents the brand's push into higher price categories and markets. A little while ago, I was talking with someone about watches. We were talking about the interest and obsession with watches that people can have, and he referred to it as a swamp. Once you get in, you'll sink deeper, and you'll never be able to get out. It can really feel like that sometimes. I've been interested in watches for quite a while, though only getting serious about them maybe five or six years ago. However, even as little as two years ago, I never would have dreamed of spending this kind of money on a watch. As I alluded to in the intro, however, I will be re-evaluating my collection and significantly trimming it down. It's easy to distort your perception of value and money when looking at luxury items, and while by no means am I regretful of buying this, it has to be acknowledged. I'm deep in that swamp. Talking with that same person, the question came up of what watch we would each buy if money was no object at all and we won the lottery. Nothing was out of the equation. Rolex, Patek, AP, Langer, Vacheron, Jacob & Co, anything. I thought about it for a while, but even then I couldn't think of any other than this watch that I'd choose. With that, I feel like I can truly say that this is my grail watch. An interesting comparison to make is with the SLGA009, a current production model. It features the same case and movement, with the only difference being the dial and the fact that it is not limited. This watch features a white birch dial that is very similar to the one also available as a mechanical version. With that in mind, 
you would think that the 009 would be priced below the 007, right? It's the non-limited, regular production model easily available. Wrong. Here in Japan, it is priced at 1,045,000 yen, a little over 5% higher than the 007. At the same time I was looking at this watch, I was also considering another. The SBGA 469, an online boutique exclusive with another interesting blue textured dial. This watch follows the more classic Grand Seiko design and is another spring drive model. However, at the price of 572,000 yen, it was a little expensive for what it is. That dial really does come alive when the light hits it though. With all that out of the way, let's finally take a look at the watch itself. And what better place to start than the dial which makes it so special. This dial is absolutely phenomenal. It is part of the reason that this watch became so popular, and it's easy to see why. Grand Seiko have become synonymous with exquisite dial finishing, textures and details. No one can match Grand Seiko at this price. This dial, as mentioned, is inspired by the water of Lake Sua, with a gentle wind sweeping ripples across the surface. Very poetic, I know, but there is no denying that they really did achieve this. As you turn the dial, you catch different shades of blue, from an almost teal to a deep navy. It's an enchanting effect when looking at it in person, and I really do find myself looking at the watch for the time, but instead just watching the dial change and forgetting about the time completely. Blue is my favourite colour for dials, and I think they got this one perfect. The case, which we'll get to in a bit, and the dial, follow what the brand described as Evolution 9 style and we can see that evident on the dial. The 9 style has 9 elements Grand Seiko adheres to. Two of these relate to the hour markers, the first being that the 12 o'clock marker is double or greater the width of the other markers on the dial, and the second is that the hour markers have deep middle grooves. Both of these are present and make this watch very legible. Typical of Grand Seiko, there is no loom on the dial whatsoever. Instead, we have a mix of immaculately polished and brushed applied markers that catch the light so well they can still be seen in low light conditions. At 3 o'clock is a framed date window with a white date wheel. I have no issue with this at all, as I've said in other videos. I think a white wheel visually balances the 9 o'clock marker on the opposite side of the dial. The brand logo is applied in gold while the name is simply printed underneath it. Below the pinion, we can see printed Spring Drive, 5 days, which tells us some more about how special the movement inside this watch is. The dial overall is simple and uncluttered, with no other markings, so a chapter ring is required to mark the minutes. The hands on this watch also differ from usual Grand Seiko hands, and instead follow a third design element from the Evolution 9 style. The minute hand is fairly familiar, though elongated to reach right up to the chapter ring. The hour hand, however, according to Nine style, needs to be distinct from the minute hand, and it definitely is. It is a much wider and shorter hand with a distinctive stripe running its length. It also comes to a blunt end rather than a sharp tip like the minute hand. This design has received mixed feedback and some criticism, but I personally have no problem with it. It makes the time very easy to read. Matching the applied logo, the second hand is gold too, and this same colour accent is present on my SBGR311. Since getting that watch, I have really appreciated that little detail, and I'm really glad it's present on the SLGA007. Covering all of this is a piece of sapphire crystal with just the slightest amount of doming. I prefer this to a flat crystal as it just feels and looks a little more elegant. There is of course an anti-reflective coating on the underside, which does a pretty good job of cutting out glare and reflections to give you a good look at that dial. There is so much more to this watch than just that dial however. As much as I love my other Grand Seiko and its case, I feel like this is even better. It again follows the design principles of the Evolution 9 style. It has a curved case profile, with a low centre of gravity, 
which helps it to feel like it really hugs your wrist. Like other GS cases, it is multifaceted featuring brushed and polished surfaces. However, here they have done what I think Grand Seiko should have been doing all along. Looking at most Grand Seiko watches, there is a big emphasis on their Zeratsu polishing, which is fine. It's an outstanding technique that creates a beautiful finish, and is done by true craftsmen. Unfortunately, I feel that it is used too much, and as a result, many of their watches come off very shiny and sparkly. The approach they have taken for this watch was much more restrained when it comes to polishing. The bezel around the dial is polished but has a flat top surface that is brushed to soften its impact, and the main body of the case is mostly brushed. On the top and bottom of the case side, there are chamfered edges, as well as on the insides of the lugs. I think they have achieved a very good balance of brushed and polished surfaces on this design. The case itself is fairly angular, and the lugs come to a pointy end without being too sharp. From the side here, we can see holes drilled in the lugs to assist with strap changes. The crown on this watch is just slightly oversized for this case, but I like that about it. It's easy to grip and turn with that fairly deep knurling, and the brand logo has been engraved deeply into it. The mix of finishing here is very nice with the raised logo being polished in front of a frosted background. We'll see some more of that frosting soon when we turn the watch over. The crown as well as the case back screw down to give this watch 100 meters of water resistance, which is pretty acceptable for an everyday watch like this. It's not a diver after all. Taking a look at the measurements of this watch, we have a 40mm case size, which is on the upper end of the perfect size for an everyday watch. The spring drive movement inside keeps thickness down to just 11.8mm, which adds to that low centre of gravity. Lug to lug, this watch is not particularly long at 47.6mm. The only measurement that feels a little out of place is the lug width at 22mm. On a watch of this size, I would have expected 20mm, but the design handles it well. On that bracelet, it is a little bit more complex than it might initially appear. From a distance, it looks just like a regular three-piece link, but if you look closely, it is actually a five-piece link. Those two faint lines you can see either side of the mid-link are actually separate pieces. On many other Grand Seiko watches, these would be polished, but they are brushed here. Only the sides of the bracelet are polished. It tapers from 22 to 20 millimeters as it leaves the case and arrives at what many people gripe about when it comes to Grand Seiko, the clasp. I personally don't really have too much of an issue with Grand Seiko clasps. Sure, they don't have any positions of micro-adjust, but I find that the two half-links provided with the bracelet allow you to get a good fit. They are slightly longer than half a regular link, so you can make some fine adjustments using different combination of links and half links. Additionally, this clasp is a little bit different to the regular one. The inlaid logo on the clasp is there to signify that it is a limited edition watch, as Grand Seiko have used 18 karat gold for it. I think it ties in nicely with the second hand and logo on the front of the watch. While we're back here, let's look at the movement powering this watch. As mentioned, it's the 9R2A spring drive movement, which made its debut in this and the SLGA008, both released for the 140th anniversary. This movement is a pretty big step forward and features quite a few improvements. There are two obvious ones. The first and probably most obvious one is the relocation of the power reserve meter from the front to the back of the watch. While some people really didn't like the power reserve hand on the front, I didn't mind it too much. It more or less became iconic for Grand Seiko's spring drive movements, as not many other watches feature it. However, on a dial like this, I think it not being there improves it significantly, letting more of that beautiful texture show through. The second improvement is the power reserve itself. It has been increased to a very impressive 5 days. Many makers are now working on extending the power reserve of their movements. Seiko themselves, with their new 6R35 movement, increased it to about 70, 
and the Swatch Group has the Powermatic 80 with, as you guessed it, 80 hours of power reserve. This movement takes it a step further by using two barrels to provide an impressive 120 hours of power reserve, and they make sure you know about it by putting it on the dial. Back here, we can see the power reserve indicator, as well as some jewels and screws. Through a couple of small holes in this plate, we can also catch a glimpse of some of the wheels in the gear train spinning. This back bridge of the movement has been finished in a frosted finish. This bridge is so large it covers most of the movement, but has been made like that to add strength, durability and shock resistance to the movement. That frosted finish on the bridge and heavily skeletonized rotor is supposed to represent the frost that covers the trees in early winter outside the Shinshu Grand Seiko Studio in Nagano, Japan. Just like the dial, this side of the watch takes its inspiration from nature too. The movement is of course a spring drive, so that means it also gets a perfectly smooth sweep of the second hand. It does this by using small electromagnets to regulate the speed of the escape wheel unwinding, rather than a traditional escapement. It combines some of the best technology of both mechanical and quartz watches, and has an accuracy rating of plus minus 10 seconds not per day, but per month. Much like the dial itself, I will also just watch the mesmerizing sweep of the second hand when I go to look at the time, and not end up checking the time itself. I had always wanted a spring drive in my collection, and I feel like this is the perfect one. Now, let's get it on wrist and see how it wears. Grand Seiko talks about a low center of gravity in their Evolution 9 style principles, and I can tell you, when on wrist, it definitely does feel that way. The size of the watch is pretty much perfect, combined with that short lug to lug length and slim height. The 22mm lug width is also not as bad as I'd initially imagined when looking at the proportions and sizes of the case. Overall, it's very comfortable, and even with an amazing dial like it has, still flies under the radar when on wrist, which is exactly what I want it to do. There was a navy blue crocodile leather strap you could option in, but I did not get one of those. Instead, I have this grey suede strap, which I think works really well on the watch, and is quite soft and comfortable too. I haven't seen any other pictures of this watch on a NATO strap, so I don't know if I'm committing a watch sin by doing this, but I really feel like it works well on this dark blue one with a gold stripe down the middle to pick out that applied logo in second hand. If you saw my previous video about the watch I designed myself, there were a few key characteristics that I wanted in my perfect watch. They were a 38 to 40 mm case size, check blue dial with either a pattern or texture, check, a flat sided case with just chamfered edges polished, check, drilled lugs, check, a simple three piece bracelet, from a distance, check, great proportions, check. I think this watch pretty much fits all of my criteria for my perfect watch. Okay, maybe it could do with some loom, but the polishing is so well done that it can catch the light even when there isn't very much of it. One thing I need to mention though, that it seems like no one else is talking about, is the slight gap between the end links and the lugs. I have watched other videos about this watch on YouTube, and seen photos of them, and it seems like this is common across every piece. I went to the Grand Seiko boutique, and asked them specifically about this. For the price you pay, and also for how precisely finished everything else is on this watch, I wasn't expecting anything like that to be off. The response I got was that it was an intentional gap left to improve the durability. If there is no wiggle room at all, there is a higher chance of the spring bar failing. I'm not completely convinced by this response, but it is clear by the level of finishing on the rest of this watch that if they wanted to, Grand Seiko would have been able to make end links with zero gaps. So, I can only assume that it was intentional for the reason I was told. It's not a big gap by any means, and it's also not something you really notice unless you're closely inspecting the watch off the wrist, but it is present. I'm really lucky to have this watch in my collection. Not only does it celebrate the 140th anniversary of Seiko as a brand, 
It is also the first watch produced using the new 9R2A movement. Others have come since, but this was the first. So, does that mean I'm done collecting new watches? Maybe. It does definitely mean that I will be cutting down my collection, and I do have a plan for that. I've already been selling some, but I'm working towards a 5-piece collection eventually. Once I get there, I'll probably make a video about it, but until then, I still have others in my collection that I haven't yet looked at on the channel. So don't fret, you can't get rid of me that easily. This was a bit longer than my usual video length, but we are talking about a very special watch, and that warrants it in my opinion. If you got this far, thank you very much for watching. What do you think about this watch? Did you have the chance to see one of these in the flesh? What is your grail watch? Let me know in the comments, and I'll see you next time.